It is good to be back this Sunday morning. I have missed you mightily, and it is great to return. I thank you for your prayers, for your cards, for your well wishes. Um, I am leaning heavily today on the pulpit and the Word of God, but leaning heavily on the pulpit as I stand before you uh, in this healing time. It's good to be back. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of your, our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Today's text from Exodus opens with the people of Israel on the edge of promise. Behind lay Egypt and bondage, and ahead stood wilderness and freedom and a vast sea. As Moses leads his people to the shores of the Red Sea, the God of Israel sends an ancient wind, the text tells us, an ancient wind from the east. In the words of Levi Yitzhak Barakop, writing two centuries ago, the Ruach Kadim, or the ancient wind, through which God does not suspend the laws of nature to work miracles, is the wind of God that was given at the beginning of the creation of the world. And its purpose was set in place at that time. The Ruach Kadim. There on the edge of promise, the Ruach Kadim stirred with purpose as fear overcame a people facing a sea. Midrashic writings tell us that a faithful man fearlessly marched into the sea. His name was Nashon. Only then did Yahweh separate the water from the seabed and make a way where there was no way. It was the faith of one man who opened the sea to a miraculous future for all the people. Often that's what it takes. It takes the faith of one to save the whole of all. Faith in the Hebrew Bible is not a belief. It is not a doctrine. It is not a creed. Faith refers to trust and loyalty expressed through commitment and obedience. Such loyalty and obedience pave the path to freedom in this story. Faith is about action. It's not about thoughts. Now, we get confused with that sometimes in Christianity because we put a lot of weight in what we're thinking. But faith is action. Faith in Hebrew tradition is action. And Yahweh does for Israel, by faith, what they could not do for themselves. Yahweh, the God of mercy and justice, delivers his people from their oppression. And this deliverance comes not because Yahweh is superior or set apart or special in any way. Deliverance comes simply because, in the words of Deuteronomy 7, 8, Yahweh loved you, and he kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors. He delivered you as he promised. Through the faith of one man, through the leadership of Moses, God's special agent, the people are delivered and Pharaoh's army drowns in the sea as a wall of water envelops the chariots and the soldiers of Egypt. As we consider the devastation of Pharaoh's army, we should read on in the story of Middle Eastern legend. Legend has it that Pharaoh survived the closing of the sea the only Egyptian to survive this disastrous effect on the chariots in the sea. Because he had learned his lesson, legend continues, he was appointed as king of Nineveh. Later, this same man, it's believed, led his people through the penitential prayer and fasting that they needed to avert disaster in the face of Jonah's decree. When Pharaoh died, the story continues, he was sent to the gates of the underworld, 
where he would greet the tyrants of history for all time with these words, why did you not learn from my example as they came through the gates of hell? The question haunts every generation of oppressors since. Why did you not learn from my example? Beyond legend, beyond rabbinical teachings, on the day that so long ago happened that God severed the tyrannical hand of Egypt and God's people were delivered by that same hand, we carry this story forward. But as we learn from the text of Exodus, continuing on into the 15th chapter, Israel gets out of Egypt, and that's the easy part. That's the easiest part of all, for God to deliver Israel from Egypt. The much harder part is getting Egypt out of Israel. And this is what I mean. Israel moves out, but they don't move on. They get stuck in the wilderness. They get stuck with slavery behind them and freedom ahead. They can't make the shift. For the next 40 years, they get stuck in the wilderness, somewhere caught between slavery and freedom. Stuckness defines the next stage of their life together. They grumble, they bicker, they fight, they worship fake gods, they blame other people, they blame Moses, they blame Aaron and everybody close to them. They blame them for all their problems. They blame them for wilderness wandering. And they repeat this cycle over and over and over and over again some more. It literally takes the change of five generations to get Egypt and slavery and oppression out of the souls of God's chosen people. You know, I find it real easy to talk about other people and their struggles way back when, way back then. I like that. I like talking about the past. I can wander around their shortcomings all day long. But now it's time to meddle a little bit with all of us, right? Now it's time to take a look at ourselves, to bring it home, if you will. So I'll ask you today, how is it with your soul? How have you been doing? In the midst of this pandemic we're in, how are you moving through the days that we're facing? Have you ever found yourself in life having a problem moving on from a crisis that has happened and come upon you? Have you ever looked back in fear because of something that happened to you or a loved one some time ago and thinking it's going to just repeat itself, it's going to do it again, and then you get stuck there? Have you ever wandered in a spiritual desert where your trail gets covered over by the seemingly godless dry wind pushing you into an unrevealed future. Do you ever have trouble moving on? In the Exodus story of your life, can you identify the place and time that God loved you so much that God saved you with the Ruach Kadim, the ancient wind, a breath coming into you, a chance coming upon you in your body, your mind, your spirit, and yet you have found yourself unable to breathe and begin anew in the liberating light of God's love, in the new breath you've been given a chance to breathe. We do get stuck, don't we? We get stuck in the pity parties of our past, even while God is whispering to us with the Ruach Kadim, you are okay. You are okay. Move on. Go forward. What we miss when we leave the Exodus story in the wilderness is this. God's miracles 
don't end on the other side of slavery, on the other side of the Red Sea. On the freedom side of the sea, God sends quails, God sends manna from heaven, God sends clouds to cover the beating down sun of the desert in the daytime. And if you've ever been in that particular desert, there are no clouds. So when God sends the clouds, that's really a God thing. And God sends a pillar of fire by night in the desperation of darkness to give them a way to see forward. I have a secret to share today. It's this. God will provide for us what we need in the wilderness that we go through. Whether we recognize it or not, we may not see it, but it's happening. In our desert wanderings, in our sultry stuckness, God sends us signs. God often offers us a hand to lift us out of the muck that we're in. There's the kindness of strangers. There's the comfort of friends. There's a call. There's a smile. There's a package that arrives unannounced. My favorite is that fruit basket that comes. Wow! Sometimes from an anonymous source. It's the touch of a child on our fist-formed hand that opens us again. It's the encouragement of a parent who tells us, you're going to be okay. This too shall pass. You're better than everything you've faced so far. It will be right again. It is the faithful prayer. It is the worship of community. It is the fellowship and the love of a faithful community. All of these serve as signs and wonders, even miracles in the desert and lostness of our lives. All these signs point to a miraculous living. Pay attention to the signs and the wonders as you wander. They are no less than road maps out of the wilderness and forward to promise. The times in which we are living are filled with blossoms in the desert. Unfortunately, the only pictures we have of the desert these days are the terrible burning fires in the Joshua Tree National Forest or the deserts in the mountains in California. And we lose track of the fact that clinging to the earth at the closest possible point are blossoms coming up in August. They're there. Blossoms rise from the desert floor while fires rage across the terrain. They find life in the terror of this time. We need to be like those blossoms in the midst of all the raging fires we see. Living is what we are designed and called to do. We live through the miracles and into the wilderness and all the way to promise. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in our lesson this morning from Romans, that all of our living is done for others. It's a beautiful passage. He puts it this way. None of us live for ourselves alone. And none of us die for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord who is the Lord of the living and the dead. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. In and out of life and death struggles, we see and we encounter days that are very challenging. We find a way through all of this to make life better because we are designed for living. We're designed to heal in the midst of whatever we're up against. Through the path of miraculous living, we are blessed by a Savior who gives us a way out of the desert wandering of our lives and points the way forward. 
In Matthew 18, 21 to 25, Jesus tells his followers, which include us, by the way, to forgive when we are wrong. You just heard the story. The story of a slave who will not forgive even though he's been forgiven. And what comes upon him as a result of that? Well, the, acceptance, the acceptable Judaic law rate of forgiveness is three times. In other words, I have to say I forgive you three times until it's true. Peter, being the good disciple that he is, says, Hey, we know you, Lord. We're going to turn it up a notch. How about seven times? That should be enough. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Seven times 70. More like that. And in Luke, Jesus puts it another way. How about 490 times? Seven times 70 times? 77 times is one way. Nine, 490 times is another way. It doesn't matter. You get the point. To forgive has to be big. It has to be large, and you have to go into it in a big way. So you forgive until you can actually hear it in your own words, until you make sense out of what you're saying. You forgive until you live it. You forgive until you feel it. You forgive until you know it. You forgive until you mean it. Now, when you forgive like this, you will feel as though you have received mercy and the hand of charity rather than the sword of justice. To find our way out of the desert, the desert of our personal lives, and even the desert of COVID-19, each of us must reach out with our moral imagination to find the land of promise and possibility. If we have learned anything about this pandemic in the last six months, we have learned that our capacity for not facing the full and fatal force of this virus has exceeded our reach of moral imagination. We have to flip the script now. We must use the full capacity of our desire to live and to help others to live so that we can outlive the coronavirus. We have to employ the full capacity of our moral imagination, our feelings, and our love to win this war with an unseen opponent. Otherwise, we will die with the fires of the desert rather than bloom with the flowers of the desert. Now is the time to deploy the Jesus survival strategy. For those of us and our children and the world's children, for all who have suffered too much already, now is the time to call upon the ancient wind, the wind that was set in place by God at the creation of the universe, the Ruach Kadim. It's time to call for that spirit to blow, to blow across us and blow in us and through us and to spread to others. As the rabbi taught the son of Nashon so many years ago, it only takes one person of faith to step into the sea to make a miraculous future for all. So will you be that person? Can you be that person? Allow the ancient wind of God to blow through you, and may the Ruach Kadim show you the past to miraculous living and forgiving. By living fully and forgiving completely, your moral imagination will be revived. With such revival, we will find our way out of the desert and into the place of promise. Amen.